Voters in Cook County could play a key role in deciding whether Illinois becomes the next state to legalize recreational marijuana. The outcome of an advisory referendum could prompt state lawmakers to pass or reject pro-pot legislation. The Illinois Family Institute opposes legalization, and in this presentation, a panel of experts explains why legalizing new era, high potency, and highly addictive marijuana will destroy lives. It will also give families and employers more reasons to flee Illinois. Marijuana proponents promise jobs and tax money, but in reality, legalization is an addictions for profit scheme. Well, thanks for joining this presentation on the push to make new era, high potency, marijuana legal in Illinois and the effort to stop it. I'm Monty Larrick. I'm joined by David Smith, the Hello. executive director of the Illinois Family Institute and Illinois Family Action. And Dave, as we've discussed before, uh, Cook County voters are deciding on an important marijuana referendum. And we'd like to see a big no turnout. Right. Um, the proponents of marijuana, recreational marijuana in the state of Illinois are pushing hard. They're holding hearings throughout the state and uh, they're um, uh, just promoting the upside to uh, having uh, marijuana. And revenue is one, uh, social justice is another, you know, and uh, they're not fully discussing the downside to marijuana. Uh, and we've we've got states out there in Colorado and Washington and Oregon uh, that uh, are experiencing some experiencing some very negative consequences. And we, we really need to have a full public debate on the positives and the negatives of such a policy. Uh, my fear is and since I've been doing this for a while lobbying in Springfield, I know that uh, they oftentimes rush this along, and uh, by the end of the year, they may vote on this. And I think that is too quick. Um, the voters need to be fully informed about the consequences of this policy. You know, I, I attended a public hearing on yeah. the effort to legalize marijuana, and folks on our side of the issue weren't allowed to speak. We were shut out. We were shut out. So, and the media isn't giving us our due diligence. If there's a, uh, you know, a few minutes segment, we may get, uh, you know, if they get a two minute segment on this issue on the nightly news, uh, we may get a whole, what, 12 seconds. Maybe eight. Maybe okay. eight. <laughs> okay. But Dave, uh, now the March 20th primary. Right. Just a few weeks away, but early voting is already underway. Right. Well, it's, it starts actually on February 8th. Today is February 6th. Okay. Two days away, early voting's going, a uh, 40-day window to vote. And so that's why we're trying to ramp things up so we can educate the voters uh, throughout the state, but especially in Cook County, because this question is on the ballot. It's a non-binding question, but it's designed to influence the state lawmakers from the Cook County region and uh, you know, basically tell them, hey, look, this is what the voters in your area want. And uh, I, I'm afraid and it's going to vote gonna, out of Cook County carries a lot of weight. Oh, it does. You know, half of the state lawmakers from uh, come from the Cook County re region down in Springfield, and so um, yeah, it's it's dangerous not not fully educating the populace about what the consequences will be. So, the outcome of this this vote could tell lawmakers, well, this is what the public wants, the voting public wants. Right. Let's give it to them, or let's not give it to them. Okay. All right. There we are. So, well, we have a panel of experts who are going to be joining us here to uh, discuss this issue. Let me uh, introduce uh, Marvella Black, who is a longtime drug prevention advocate in the Chicago area. Uh, she has facilitated workshops across the country in her efforts to keep drugs from reaching young people. And for over 35 years, she's volunteered with Child Evangelism Fellowship. Dr. Aaron Weiner is a licensed clinical psychologist and the director of addiction services at Linden Oaks, Linden Oaks Behavioral, my apologies. Uh, Dr. Weiner is a member of the board for the Society of Addiction Psychology and on the Science Advisory Board for Smart Approaches to Marijuana. Thank you guys very much for joining us. Appreciate it. Good to be here. 
may have a third guest join us shortly, but uh, let's start out with a question for Ron or um, for Marbella. Marbella, uh, you have been working in the community uh, on, in Chicago for some time now. You've seen the ravages of drug addiction and what drugs are doing in uh, your area, but proponents of legal marijuana are suggesting that legalization will actually improve those communities because it will bring tax revenue to them and it will help improve the judicial system for minorities and it will allow police to concentrate on more important safety concerns. I'd like to get your reaction to that. Well, that really disturbs me. Um, first of all, uh, they don't really address issues. Uh, I love children. I mean, that's where my heart is. But they don't address the impact of what's going to happen to the children. When you look at uh, the classroom, for instance, uh, so many of the students seem to be uh, of special needs. I don't know where it's coming from, where there's drugs or whatever it is, marijuana, whatever, but our children seem to be afraid. They can't have, they don't, uh, uh, they're not in a, an environment that is conducive for learning. And what will that do to the students that are in the classroom now? Uh, we have students that are, are afraid to even be in the class, afraid to go to school because of the gangs, because of the drugs that are in our neighborhoods. So uh, when we look at our families, we know that marijuana has destroyed many families. You either know someone who has been affected by this, a family, or you know uh, it's your family. So. What happens to these families? What happens to the violence? What happens to um, many of the other aspects of uh, single moms or moms who are taking marijuana? What happens? So Marvella, you're, you're saying that the, the increase in marijuana in communities is a bad thing uh, Absolutely. For, for the children. Mm -hmm. The start of the family, uh, uh, when we look at the children, I, my heart breaks. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we know for a fact that even if a mom is breastfeeding and she's taking marijuana, that affects that child. Even if the father is taking uh, marijuana, that affects the child. And it could affect the child up until the, about the age of 10, where uh, when it will dissipate in their system. So what does that do to that child? That's right. Well, one, one uh, hospital in Pueblo, Colorado is reporting that 8 to 10 percent of newborns now test positive for marijuana. Yeah. 8 to 10 percent of newborns. And uh, we, can, we can probably talk to the doc on that. And I mean, the psychological effects uh, uh, of that kind of thing. Well, Dr. Weiner, uh, you see firsthand right. uh, the impact of uh, addiction, uh, different drugs. And uh, when we talk about marijuana, I think a lot of people think, well, it's marijuana, it's not addictive. Uh, but your experience is that marijuana is highly addictive, right? Uh, absolutely. So, there's, I think there's a tendency with this drug for people to map their own experiences on to what's going on and think of it as fact. But the bottom line of it is that the CD, this is straight out of the CDC, actually. The CDC tells us one in 10 adults who uses will develop an addiction. One in six kids who uses will develop an addiction. And 30% of the people who use daily. And honestly, in terms of the people we see in our clinic, I'd say that uh, marijuana is the second most common substance we see for people coming in with addictions behind alcohol right now. Opioids are, are third right behind that. It, it's something a lot of people tend to marginalize it. Additionally, a lot of people tend to think that it's the same stuff that they used to smoke. Like in terms of parents thinking about kids in, at Woodstock, 
THC was maximum 4% in, in marijuana. These days, um, it, honestly, it was about 16% on the street. But if you go to websites for mar medical marijuana dispensaries, even, you'll see that the THC concentration there gets up to 24, 25. I saw one the other day uh, here in Naperville that was 29%, which is, is six wow. or more times stronger than uh, what people used to be smoking. Now, not to mention the extracts that can be up to 93% uh, pure. So it's so, really a very different animal and it, it has a lot of negative effects on kids. So is it safe to say that the higher the THC level or the, the stronger the concentrate, the greater the addictive properties of it? That's a really good question. Uh, in terms of the addictive properties, it's difficult to say. So one of the aspects about it is it's hard to study something that is so variable. So okay. every strain of marijuana is different. So what sure. one person is using versus another are hard to know. What we do know, though, is that the higher uh, percentage of THC, the more related it is to having marijuana-induced psychotic breaks, which is actually not a rare thing, unfortunately. We see the most in our uh, teens and young adults because the, they're the ones most often using the extracts, which are so concentrated. This is a psychotic break that sometimes is transient and goes away quickly, but sometimes sticks around. And in terms of mental health effects, both on a, a positive or negative direction, the one thing that we know for sure is it's associated with psychotic breaks and schizophrenia. So what does it look like? What does a psycho marijuana-induced psychotic break look like? I, I don't know. Well, it can take a, a lot of different forms. Everyone's psychosis is different, honestly. But if, if someone, I just one that, that I saw firsthand was this, this was someone who, who when it occurred, they, they left the house, they stopped talking uh, in, in English, they started talking in gibberish. They thought that uh, they, ex uh, they exhibited a lot of paranoia. This was a 23-year-old male. He uh, wouldn't let anyone he knew near him because he thought they were all part of some conspiracy. He became very violent. Um, it, it was it was very distressing to everyone, and and the, the last I heard about it, he was still on the street. Honestly, um, this wasn't a case that that resolved itself. So, um, Marvella, do you see any of these things happening in the community and the kids that you're working with? Do you see any of these? Um, uh, do you call them symptoms, Doc? I'm not sure if those are symptoms or just uh, outflows of uh, the psychotic break. I don't see it in the classrooms that I visit. However, I do see it on the street. Uh, it, uh, you see young, especially the young men walking up and down the streets, talking to themselves. It can be below zero and they'll have their coats open. They, they, look, they look distressed. They, they almost look like it's hopeless. And so uh, you wonder if they're homeless. You see a lot of homelessness especially uh, in areas, I would say, Inglewood, Roseland, those areas, many of the young people are homeless. And uh, so- it would suggest that, you know, those homeless folks you're seeing out on the street, that's a result of hard drug addiction, stuff like cocaine, and heroin, and uh, what have you. But- but does it start really with marijuana in your estimation, Marvella? In my estimation, absolutely. Marijuana to me is a gateway. And that's based on your experience. Um, so clinically, Doc, is it something that you see too? Is, is, uh, is it something that you would affirm in your experience? Oh, well, absolutely. And I'll talk a little bit about my experience, but I think the data also speaks volumes because I think that a lot of people... Uh, are, are, are leaning on belief when I think it's more important that we lean on fact. And sure. so my, my, my experience is, I'll start with that, is, is that absolutely. So it's not like someone, so, so when people use substances, particularly like heroin, oftentimes it's not for fun. It's because they're coping with something else in a very <laughs> uh, unhealthy way. And by the time they get to heroin, oftentimes um, it, it's, again, it's not about relief or euphoria as much as it's about just not going through withdrawal and trying to avoid the negative impact of it. And so, but, but even so, it's not like someone in the very beginning is like, you know what, I'm having a really hard day. I'm gonna tie my arm off, find a needle, which a lot of us don't have lying around, um, and, and inject myself. It's, it's, it doesn't really happen. Um, it doesn't work that way. By the time someone gets to heroin, they've passed through other things. And actually, we know that 90% of people who use heroin have also used marijuana, 90%. We also know that, uh, that uh, and I don't have the, the graphs with me right now, but it, it's something along the lines of um, 
I think three times more likely that a, a child will use heroin if they're using marijuana okay. versus if they are just unmuted. And we, we also know that if someone's smoking marijuana, yes, if a child 12 to 17 okay. is smoking marijuana, they are 10 times more likely to use any harder substance. So it, it makes sense on a number of levels and actually the data uh, shows, shows that as well. Excellent. Well, now we've got uh, Ron Castagna. Did I say that right, Ron? Uh, pretty close, Castagna like lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You're an educator in Colorado, and you uh, held uh, talks with the PTA about the implications of marijuana. So, uh, as we know, uh, back in 2014, I think, Colorado legalized recreational marijuana. What's life like in uh, Colorado? At your uh, school, Ron. Well, I am retired, but I just happened to be in a high school today, past the football coach. I said, well, what's your season look like next year? He said, well, if I could keep half of my kids off of marijuana, quote, unquote. Um, Colorado youth are now number one in the nation. Uh, we are 50% higher than anybody else for teenage use. Suspensions are up 18%. And we kind of go down our merry little road here. I started um, an initiative with the help of uh, a legislator uh, to get on the ballot. And here's the scary part of the marijuana industry, if they, as they call themselves, is that um, our initiative was to cap the percentage of THC at 17%. And the marijuana industry has so much money that it became impossible for us to even find the, the companies to get the signatures on the, on the ballot. To, uh, to help us out because uh, they were block, blocking us in every path we could go. So we, as the um, state that was gonna launch this has done a terrible job. I don't care what our legislators tell us or even our governor who walks the fence on this. Um, it has been a disaster for our young people. I'm an educator. I was at the same high school for 17 years and I will tell you, we as adults are role models. There is no getting around it. And when we sit there and say getting high is a recreation, that flies in the face of everything we've stood for as educators. Well, it's not just recreation, right? I mean, now we've got it commercialized and being promoted as a business in states uh, to young people saying, well, first it was medical, now it's recreational. Uh, and now we're sending that message is, hey, it's not a big deal. And the, when right. they're fighting you, just to, to even just put a cap on it, uh, the doctor that we, we were talking to said, you know, it used to be 4%. Now it's up to, like you said, 20 some percent. Um, and, and just trying to cap it just sounds like common sense, at least a, a, a good start to roll okay. it back. A little. Here's the thing. It can be 20. It can be 30. Colorado is very good at growing pot. If you take the wax, you can get 100% THC. With the, the invention of the vape pens, kids can sit in class. This is actually what got me on Hannity because um, uh, I was just shocked. You can sit in class with a vape pen, be very discreet, no odor, and have 100% THC in your, in your pot. Um, just, just getting high. It's absolutely the scariest thing. And so when those psychotic breaks happen, um, you know, they say there's no lethal dose to marijuana. But when you look at the deaths that we've had, the husband who kills the wife because he ate too many brownies because he was drinking as well, um, no warning labels. How did we get past this? This is worse than the tobacco industry. This is the tobacco industry on steroids. Yeah. Well, Ron, you... You said something that this has been a disaster for young people and kids, but this was sold to Colorado voters as going to be strictly enforced for adults, 21 and older. Okay. And we're hearing that same line here in Illinois. Okay. Here is, here is the crazy part. You can be a caregiver in Colorado at 18. You can have six plants. You can have six plants per patient. You can have up to six patients. That gives you 36 plants you can have. One ounce of marijuana will give you somewhere between 20 and 35 or so joints. One ounce. 
a, a pot plant can grow anywhere, depending on how good you are at it. A pound to four and a half pounds, it has three grow seasons. All you got to do is do the math. That 18 year old has their hands on enough marijuana to blanket a lot of places. Well, you know, I, I like to say that Cheech and Chong couldn't handle all that marijuana. And what we're seeing right now in Oregon is a federal prosecutor who's saying, holy cow, we've got a huge surplus of marijuana. Where's that going? Are, are we seeing it, Marvello, on the streets of Chicago with the young people? Where's that marijuana going? Well, early on, Chicago had a huge pot bust. It all came from Colorado. I, <laughs> I will tell you, we have in the, in the city of Denver, there are more pot shops than there are Starbucks and McDonald's put together. This is an absolute crime. And here's the other piece of this. As I was there testifying a couple of weeks ago, um, it was said, well, this isn't good because we're incarcerating people. There is a big difference between commercializing and decriminalizing. And I'm all right for decriminalizing so that we aren't putting people in jail over an ounce of marijuana. But the industry, this isn't grandma's marijuana anymore. This is really potent stuff. And the only objective, this isn't even like drinking a beer. You are getting high immediately. And when you have an industry that has marketed the way they have in Colorado with gummy bears and cookies, and my wife has done a great job calling the, the National Girl Scout Association so they would get after some of these companies that are making it like Girl Scout cookie marijuana and um, the oh, oh, uh, well, Ron, I just happened to see a story on the news where Girl Scouts were selling cookies outside of a marijuana retail <laughs> shop uh, and doing uh, a bang up business. Yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> well, sure. If it gives you the munchies still, um, you know, uh, but how sad is that? That that's that's what we've come to. Is it every dollar or do we want to look at the real impact? The real impact in my eyes is that for every dollar we generate in taxes, we are spending 10 times that much in rehabilitation, helping our young people. And I will tell you, these are in Denver, but the wealthier communities in Colorado have voted no on having the shops. So I live in an area called Centennial. Our city council said no. Golden said no. Littleton said no. So it's Denver and in some cases, this is in, in, and it's in Aurora, it's in our poorer communities. So one of the arguments at the state legislature hearing was that, yes, we're putting um, people in jail, which is not true because Chicago has already limited this down to a fine. But the argument was, well, then they can't pay for the fine. So then the fine becomes a problem. And then they end up in jail. Well, here's the first part of the problem. The first part of the problem is why are you spending money on pot if this is the money you don't have to pay for the ticket and you're worried about feeding your kids? We've got something very out of whack here. Marvella, let me ask you this uh, before we go to Dr. Weiner again. Ron brought up something that uh, the pot shops outnumber the McDonald's. And I've been on the south side of Chicago. I used to cover City Hall, and I've, I've seen the west side. And on the west side of the city, there, it's like a vast wasteland in some areas. Yes. Will the marijuana industry move into these communities? And provide jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can uh, get marijuana anytime, day or night. <laughs> I mean... Sorry there. Okay. It, it's like going to Walmart. <laughs> and I mean, it's available to anyone. And it's so open. I mean, you can sit on a corner and you'll say, oh, there goes a drug deal. No. But instead of McDonald's, will they have a retail marijuana shop in these communities? Will that be happening? I don't think they have to have a retail shop. Really? <laughs> they're, they're already there on the on the street corners yeah. is what you're saying I mean, Marla, right right i mean why yeah. would they have to have a shop yeah they, they don't need all that overhead the brick and mortar the <laughs> <Exactly. workman's> <laughs> <top>. <laughs> right and that cuts into their profits 
Why yeah. would you pay 28% tax when you can put it out the back door? That's <laughs> Doctor, I'm kind of curious. Um, we're hearing about uh, young people using marijuana and this high potency and highly addictive mode of marijuana. When they're young, what does that do long-term to these young people's brains? Right. Mm -hmm. Well, unfortunately, the, the data that we have is, is very compelling in a negative direction. So uh, essentially, your, your brain isn't done developing until you're between 25 and 30 years old. And actually, the reason why kids get addicted to this more easily than adults, I mentioned that one in six versus one in 10, is that the part of your brain uh, that, that makes the, the, the abstract decisions, planning, uh, what we call executive function, is the last to develop. It's in your frontal lobes. It's right up front. And what we've found is that as kids are growing, we actually have data now from studies where they're called fMRIs, where you put, you put the child in and you scan their brain while they do different tasks over time. We've actually been tracking kids for years now, is that we can see that kids' brains are not growing where they're supposed to grow. They're not pruning because your brain also prunes as you grow. It's, it's not pruning where it's supposed to prune. And it's resulting in a six to eight point IQ drop if someone's using marijuana regularly wow. from adolescence. Wow. Repeat that. Six to eight point IQ drop. Wow. What yeah, does that mean? That? These, again, are from peer reviewed uh, published uh, pub publications and journals. A lot of the statistics that you'll hear from the pro side of this issue are actually put out by the marijuana industry. And again, we know from cigarettes that, that this is what they do. They, they create their own research that isn't accurate. And, and the upshot to folks uh, pushing from our side of the debate is that if you actually look at what's coming out of government publications from like DEA and the CDC and SAMHSA, and if you look at what's coming out of these medical journals, you see a story that's very consistent with what we're telling you today. So it's not hy hyperbole to say that this is the dumbing down of America in, in a very real way, right? Mm -hmm. and I, well, absolutely. I mean, there, there's, I don't think that there's anybody, any police officer, any person who says, you know what we need? We need more high people. Or right. <laughs> we need more people drunk or we need more people stoned. And, and the bottom line is that this whole debate isn't being fueled even honestly by marijuana users. It's being fueled by the industry that we've spoken about over and over and over again. And so, they're really in it to make money. It's an entrepreneurial thing. So that's right. That's right. So, so Ron, um, if if half if the football coach is worried about uh, fielding a team next year, what what is this stuff doing to test scores and SAT and ACT scores and all that? You know, we pass so much legislation to improve test scores and um, accountability and these big tests from the federal government, which they never funded. But if you take what the doctor just said, and you take that six to eight points. Let's put it in real hard terms here. I'm working with an average IQ kid, which is 100. 100 IQ takes six to eight points. He goes from the 50th percentile to the 28th percentile. Wow. So that is, that is not something that I'm excited about working with in terms of um, the lethargic nature and all the other things that come along with the drug. Now, I also have to deal with the fact that I'm fighting um, kind of a losing battle. I'm supposed to get his test scores up as an educator, but I'm also supposed to get him off of drugs and uh, make sure that he hasn't done permanent damage. And that's the scary part. That doesn't come back. Those six to eight points don't come back. And, and as the doctor said, the research is there for a, with a lot of studies on that. And that is not just something that scare tactics or anything else. It's the reality of what goes on. I have sat across kids and parents with parents in tears because kids have screwed up their lives because of being so addicted to the marijuana that they have given up soccer scholarships and opportunities wow. for college because this becomes the most important thing in their life at the most critical point in their life. Marvella, are you, are you seeing that in your community? Uh, Yes, I am, but I do have a question for a doctor. Sure. Uh, what is the youngest age that you've seen come through your agency? Or, oh, goodness. Because well, I, I'm really we're looking at kids in kindergarten. But we, only take, we only take as young as 12, and, we, and sometimes we see 12. But um, it's. Oh, it's Mar Marvella, though, let me go back to that. What, did you say you see kids as young as in kindergarten? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. 
I mean, and that's because they've gotten into their parents or brothers and sisters stash. Right. Are and we so, talking about gummy bears and uh, brownies or are we talking about actually smoking a marijuana joint? Actually smoking a joint. I can't we've, imagine. We've seen the other. We've seen the gummy bears and the kids rush to the emergency room. We have basically um, just a very few number of adolescent neuropsychs in the state of Colorado. And the, the, when kids come out, let's even, let's go to the medical one. Let's go to the big argument, CBD oil. The Charlotte's web for Colorado still has THC in it. It is not the, the, your, the English European version of CBD oil. So it's actually very dangerous. And once those kids come in for treatment, most neuropsychs or anybody else dealing with the kids' seizures will not touch them because they're not gonna prescribe another medicine. And it doesn't work for everybody. So we've had people move to Colorado, up and their family thinking that here's the promised land of CBD oil, and it isn't. Uh, you just mentioned, Ron, that uh, you've seen kids rush to the emergency room uh, as a result of a marijuana overdose, but yet, on my Facebook page, on the Illinois Family Institute Facebook page, I have people demanding uh, that you just can't overdose on marijuana. What are they being rushed to the emergency room for, if that's the case? And I want to hear what uh, Dr. Weiner has to say, too. Well, they're having psychotic breaks. I mean, I'm not in the medical field, but um, the doctors I've talked to say it's um, uh, pretty careless uh, we had a young man, I'll give you one, 19 years old, should be able to handle it. Ate a quarter of the cookie, didn't feel anything, continued to eat the cookie. He's pretty famous. It was early on. He ended up jumping off a building and killing himself. We had the husband who killed his wife. So imagine what it's doing to little kids. If, they're, if, if the adults are having a psychotic break, imagine what it's doing to a young forming mom sure. who gets a hold of a handful of gummy bears. Sure. I mean, I, I couldn't stop at one gummy bear. I mean, <laughs> look at me. But, but Doc, talk about that. First on the, the overdose situation and then the psychotic episodes that, that Ron just talked about. Yeah, well, I'd be happy to talk about that. And, and I also want to touch on, uh, on the seizures as well, because I think it's important. Okay. In terms of, of the gummy bears, though, what, what's, what's going on with, with edibles, there's a couple of things, right? When, when you eat it, what's in there is in there and it's going into your body. And something that you can do if you're smoking is you can slow down, right? So you, you, you take a drag, you can take long, you, you, can, you can control that. But when you take an edible, it, it's just, it's going in. Not only that, but we found from research that your peak THC level in your blood doesn't come from edibles until two to three hours in because it oh. has to be absorbed through your, yeah, through your stomach lining as opposed to, to vaping or, or smoking, which goes much more quickly. And so what that means is that you don't really know what's going to happen to you until you're pretty far along. It also has pretty intense uh, negative implications for driving, which we can touch on hopefully at some point today as yes, well. Yes, let's do that. Um, yes. Uh, but, but before we do about seizures, I think it's so critical. Um, th there, was a, there was a massive literature review put out by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. It's free online. They are a well-respected body. This particular report was over 500 pages long, summing up everything that we know about marijuana from, again, reputable sources. And they grouped their conclusions into how strong the evidence is. And actually, seizures is and, and epilepsy is under the category of we have no evidence to support this is even helpful at all. And wow. the reason for that, yeah, the reason for that is that in science, we say that something has, is strongly supported if we've replicated the study, if it's things called randomized controlled trials where you've got control groups and double, you know, double blinding and things like that. What happened with seizures was there, um, Ron mentioned Charlotte's Web. It was named after Charlotte Fiji, which was a girl who this worked for her. She went from like 300 seizures down to 12, but then that was sensationalized and it was put all over the media. And then people thought, well, pot is good for seizures. But if you actually look at the research, it's not even on limited evidence. There's no evidence to support it. It's just so minimal. It's a couple of case studies. So again, there's, uh, there's a lot of misperceptions about this. I'd encourage anyone to look, to look at the facts. No, we need to look at those facts. It's very important that we understand it. But let's talk a little bit about driving too, because um, I like to say to people, look, if, if Monty and I were having dinner, we had a glass of wine or a, a bottle of beer, um, 
it may not affect us, right? Uh, probably won't affect us. But if we sat down and shared a joint, it's going to affect us. Uh, we're going to become intoxicated. And that's going to inevitably affect our driving, our motor skills, and perceptions. Whereas alcohol is in and out of our system in 24 hours, uh, marijuana could be in our system for quite a long time. And Doc, I'd like you to, to, to talk to that a little bit because I've heard that it could affect your motor skills for up to 72 hours or longer. Yeah, that's a really important question. So one of the things that we hear a lot is that there, you know, that there's a 0.08 for, for marijuana, like for, for driving. Right. And the problem is that, that there's simply not. So what we've found from a lot of really good research, uh, Dr. Marilyn Hustis has been the one who's done the most of this, is that not only is it absolutely impaired, and uh, it's, it's something that you would be impaired in the same way that you are if, if you're drunk. What she found was that the impairing effects were present regardless of whether or not someone was at what has been thrown out there as the 0.08 of pot, which is called five nanograms per liter of blood. But what wow. she found was any THC in the blood at all, they found these impairing effects. Additionally, people don't metabolize it in the same way. So with alcohol, whatever your blood alcohol level is, it's going to go down pretty much no matter who you are by 0 0.015 an hour, which roughly translates to about a drink an hour. It doesn't work that way with pot. We all process it differently. So in terms of when are you safe to drive after you smoke? Do you know if you're safe to drive after you smoke? It's, it's really hard to say. And then add the edibles part on as well. Those, those are catching on where it's not even going to hit you until a while after you eat it. Uh, it it's, it's not good. And we've seen it play out in the real world. I think uh, car claims we are up, I think it's 14% in Colorado. Ron, maybe you'll speak more to that. Washington, Oregon as well. Traffic fatalities are up. AAA put out a report about this. Um, you'll hear a lot of this discredited or kind of pushed aside from the proponents of the issue. But again, if you actually look at the government publications, you'll see a very different story. Ron, what's driving like in Colorado post-legalization? Um, it's, it's not great. There, pe people are vaping in cars. So um, unlike uh, liquor, it's uh, pretty prevalent. And um, the studies they've done from Haida all the accidents are up. I will tell you a personal story. We had a car in our backyard one night. We've been in the same house for 15 years and there was a car. They opened the door, reeked of pot. Um, we didn't have the testing. The police couldn't really do anything about it, passed the, the, the sobriety test, but um, higher than a kite. And so it's, um, it's, a, it's a big issue and again, um, who wants to be the legislator while it's against federal law that passes this and has to face somebody that says this person as high on marijuana um, killed a family member and it's and it's happening and we've added another another problem to our, our already overcrowded streets. It's worth, it's worth watching well. the, um, the, the Facebook live video right now. Uh, please feel free to uh, put a comment in or ask a question and we'll throw it out to our panel of experts here and uh, get their feedback for your question. So uh, please feel free to join us. Marvella Black, uh, you probably recall a few years ago, there was a, a big effort to stop the big tobacco companies from marketing to kids, particularly kids in the inner city. And they were attacking Joe Camel, you know, it was a kind of a cartoon figure and uh, promoted cigarettes. So here we have the marijuana industry now promoting edible candy, the uh, candy infused with uh, marijuana. Boy, and lawmakers want to legalize this. You have to just be up in arms about this, Mar Marbella. Um, I have so much pain involved in this. Uh, when I look at, it's almost to me like it's hopelessness. Uh, I know it's not hopeless because if we take the time to educate, if we take the time to uh, spend time with these children in the schools, with the teachers, with, the, with everybody that we can, uh, my cry is, where's the church involved in this? Right. Where is it knocking on the doors of the church? We need your help. That's right. Um, 
And so my cry is that the church would take up the arms. You know, up- that's a very good point, Marvella. I have a friend who runs uh, an abstinence ministry, uh, and he used to be a pastor. Mm-hmm. And he was getting tired of seeing young teenager girls coming into his office saying, I'm pregnant. And, you know, he thought, you know, we get these kids to adopt the child out or visit a crisis pregnancy center was important. But he thought, we got to get ahead of this. Mm-hmm. We, uh, we need to start teaching abstinence. And I think that's exactly what we need to be doing here in Illinois is teaching the young people exactly the, the, the dangers and the consequences of doing this. I mean, uh, listening to Ron talk about, you know, the drop in IQ points and, and uh, the apathy uh, that, joint, that, that affects you afterwards. I mean, that really is going to affect you throughout your entire life, your career, your possibilities, uh, your school choices. You know, uh, it's, uh, it's quite dangerous, I think. And, and the church needs to also, speaking of which, because they're already dealing with the, the fallout, right, of the addicts. They're mm-hmm. going to be, why don't we get ahead of this mm-hmm. and try to teach them about sobriety? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's, it occurs to me, it's what scripture says, be sober-minded. And uh, I think that's very important. We got a question. Well, we do, but I do have a question for Marabella. What kind of feedback are you getting from pastors about this, Marabella? the pastors that you work with? Uh, Some of them are, I I guess, frustrated. Uh, I would say that they understand, some of them understand what's going on, but the parishioners seem to be lethargic. Mm. Uh, It's like, I don't want to deal with this. It's easier not to deal with it. Even though I'm in pain, I don't want to deal with it because I'm used to this pain. I'm used to living in fear. I'm used to uh, the violence that's around me. And I, that doesn't make sense, but that's the way it is. It, I, I don't want to go outside uh, the church doors to try to minister. I'm going to sit inside because I'm comfortable here. I can sit in and go to church and I've done my duty. I go home, lock my doors and stay in and I'm done. Yeah. And isn't, and isn't that enough to sit there and put this back where it really belongs? Marvella, educators, we want to teach kids in the classroom to avoid what adults are doing. And isn't that the sad thing? Because some legislators, I think, are under the impression that when it's convenient, oh, the voters want this. It's going to get us out of some economic crisis in Chicago. It's not going to make a dent in the economic crisis in Chicago. No. What it's going to do is put the cart before the horse. We haven't done enough around this substance stuff and we're gonna pu- push it on to the churches who already have enough on their plates and to educators that have enough on their plates because legislators won't do the right thing. And I will tell you, I've lost some, some dear friendships with some of my friends that were legislators because they support the marijuana industry piece and I'm opposed to it and they know it. And um, that's another sad fact is that this is a dividing line and it's all about money and it's all about contributions. You can't even get a straight answer out of the Denver Post anymore because their section of the cannabis um, section of their newspaper is what's probably keeping them alive. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, my concern is also, what are we doing to educate our parents? Um, I just firmly believe that education starts at home first. A lot of us, you know, we know that uh, our children are having babies. So children are raising children, but somehow or another, we've got to reach the parents. We can reach, we've got to reach the children and the parents at the same time. It just, um, there's no way of getting around it. You mean the parents that are pumping breast milk with THC? I mean, that is, that's at the crux of this. We've labeled something that is not recreational as recreational. This is not a toy. This is not going out for a run. This is not something you play with. And that's the message we've sent. We have recreational marijuana. Mm -hmm. What is that? What, what's recreational about a drug? And that's, and that's the sad fact is our, the adults 
in our General Assembly, in our State House, have opened the floodgates of all this for the community. Well, and I'm, I'm embarrassed that Colorado did. Yep. Yeah. Dr. Weiner, uh, we have a question from a viewer. Uh, is there a test to detect the influence of marijuana? Like a blood alcohol test? Is there a THC blood alcohol test, blood test? Yeah, yeah. So, um, we, so you can test it in a number of ways. The question is how specific it, is it and how far back does it look? So um, you can absolutely get it from the blood um, as long as it's still in there, but it tends to leave the, the blood reasonably quickly because it's something, we call it lipophilic. It's very attracted to fat. So it shoots into your brain quickly because your brain has a lot of fat. Uh, you can, of course, get it out of urine, but the issue with that is that it sticks around there for up to 30 days um, after you've last smoked. And so if you're doing a screen, it's really tough for employers because you're going to you're going to test positive. They don't know if you smoked that morning or you smoked a week ago. It's, it's impossible to tell. There's, they're trying to develop a saliva test. I don't I don't know if that's uh, out yet or if it's if it's readily available. Um, one quick thing I want to add while I've, while I've got the screen on me, um, we talk about how many people want this. And actually, uh, Smart Approaches to Marijuana released a poll done by Mason Dixon, again, legit all across the state, asking two questions. The first one was uh, the way it's normally asked. Do you support legalization? And they got the result that you normally see, where 60, 60 to 65 percent say yes. However, in their poll, they followed that up with one that says, so here's what's going on in Illinois. We have decriminalized this already. That means that it's like getting a traffic ticket. We also have a medical cannabis program, so you can get it that way too. Given this, do you want to legalize it, keep what we currently have, repeal uh, decriminalization, or repeal everything? And what we find when you ask, when you give them the information about what we have and you give them those choices, is that literally that, that approval rating for legalization drops to 29%. 47% wow. of people want to keep it right where it is right now, and everybody else wants to remove certain parts of it. So that press release just came out on Monday. But you give people information and you give them choices so they know what they're, ta know what they're actually saying, and you see a very different story. That's like a 30-point 30, 30 drop. 30 that point. is very important information. And unfortunately, I think some of our state lawmakers who are proponents of this legislation are moving very quickly because they want to be able to um, – strike while the iron is hot. They certainly don't want to pay attention to what's going on in Colorado. And uh, my, I also think cynically that they want to boost the young person vote um, in Cook County in the March primary because this question's on the ballot in, in March. Uh, and they're also thinking about putting it on the ballot in November. Uh, so again, trying to boost the young, vote, the young person vote uh, as well. Okay. If I may, actually, I, I was downtown. Uh, I was downtown uh, recently after that hearing. Good to see you again, Ron, by the way. We were both testifying there. Um, uh, I actually got a meeting with uh, Cook County Board President uh, Tony Preckwinkle and, 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 and her staff. And I went down there literally to talk about this issue, that they're planning on asking it in that yes or no way, which we know inflates the numbers. And, and, and I, I gave them that information straight up. I forwarded them the poll when it came out on Monday. I told them when you ask it this way, you get inaccurate results. So we'll see what happens in March. But I, I literally went down, I went downtown, <laughs> Clark Street, I went, I went up to the sixth floor and I told them, you're going to be asking this in a biased way. And so thank you. Well, we'll see what ends up happening in March. But well, thank you for doing that. But unfortunately, I think a lot of people are having an emotional reaction to the question instead of an intellectually informed reaction to question. Dr. Weiner, you work for Linden Oaks uh, out of Naperville, and mm -hmm. I'm wondering, uh, that, that's kind of an upscale community, Naperville. Mm -hmm. A lot of your clients, upscale kids, uh, is this impacting, you know, middle class kids and upper income kids as, as just as much as in inner city kids? Oh, absolutely they are. Uh, it's, again, we, we have plenty. In fact, I would say that the majority of kids who come through our adolescent program, it's marijuana. Additionally, at the end of the hearing that we had two weeks ago on public health, there were a couple of very, very powerful high school speakers who came to talk about what this meant to them and to the high school. And they were from an affluent area. They were out of Stevenson High School. And one of them actually was um, what was, was talking about a testimonial about their own addiction with, with marijuana. Um, in this affluent neighborhood and how it very nearly derailed their life. And only, only through treatments and a lot of effort and changing all of their friends and everything else were they able to extricate 
themselves from that. But again, to me, that just also reinforces the dangers of what, what message are we sending when we say this is recreational? Enough people are already confused when they come into the clinic about like, is it a medicine? Is it a drug? The state says it's okay. That's a whole nother thing. There's a lot of conditions, including seizures, that the state has said that you can use this for that have no basis in science. And so it really confuses the public a lot. And yes, we see a lot of kids using from all demographics. Well, we have a question, and you may have touched on this a little bit, uh, Bill, already, but uh, here's the question. How big of a problem is it in Colorado with drivers using marijuana? Uh, Ron. Ron, uh, uh, you talked uh, about the situation uh, by your own home, but right. uh, Here, it's got to be. Here's an article from the Denver Post, and it says pot use doubles crash risk. They've, they've done their studies as to the harms of it. It's, um, it's you know, Haida, the Rocky Mountain Haida report is um, pretty, uh, pretty darn good. And it's uh, seen a drastic increase in crashes, in burglaries. We are, um, I've never seen anything like this. And I've been out here um, a good 30 plus years and it's uh, pretty bad. This isn't gonna get rid of the black market, by the way. June 17th, our Attorney General, Cynthia Kaufman, who had to defend states' rights because the people passed marijuana, we had the largest bust, she said, in marijuana, 2,600 illegal pot plants, 4,000 pounds of marijuana. This group was making $200,000 a month and they, they busted 74 people. So if this is the idea of we've got to stop incarcerating people and we thought the black market was going to go away, we are putting people in jail at record numbers because of this and the fact that when the kids do get hooked, that 9 to 10% of the kids that have that gene in their personality that gets them addicted to this stuff, they, the cartels are right there to sell them crack and heroin. Wow, that's that's really good. You know, um, regarding car accidents, I posted an article on my Facebook page uh, a couple weeks ago saying that uh, auto insurance has gone up by 3% uh, because of all the accidents. Um, a friend of mine who's in the industry said it's gone up 10% in Colorado because of the, the accidents. And uh, it was funny, uh, Doc, you, you said that people are mapping their own experiences on the uh, outset of this. And um, I had a friend who commented on that article, which was from, I think, the Denver Post, but it was a reputable newspaper. Uh, and he said, well, that's just not true. <laughs> it's, not, it's not true. Um, how, how do we get, to, get through to people like this who are mapping their own experiences and, and I don't know, defending? Is that what you can, you can say? Defending the use of this product? Yeah, you, you know, I... I think, we're, so we're in a society right now, I feel like, where we live in our own um, our, our own tribal echo chambers in a way. Where <laughs> truly, where it, it, it's, hard, it's hard to hear things outside of our point of view. Um, I, I mean, I actually make a habit of going to all sorts of different news sites every day just to see, and it's amazing how the front pages are different, depending on, depending on the, like completely different, depending on where you go. And I think it's so hard to get balanced information. What, what I think is that it's, what I try to, when I meet with legislators, I'm, I'm more interested in meeting with people who are on the fence about this because I found that unfortunately right now, people who have said opinions seem to not even be open to other points of view, no matter how reasonable. And I, I hate to be pessimistic about it. It's not that I won't talk about it. It's just, it's very easy for someone to say, well, that's not true. Or I heard different. I actually had a legislator say to me at the end of a conversation, you know, well, I, I read something that said uh, pot isn't actually addictive. And I was flabbergasted, you know, this is someone with a platform and with influence and it, it, no, you know, just absolutely not. Like this is, that's just patently untrue. And so I, I think that there's just a lot of that going around. All we can do is continue to put the information out there, cite sources. That's another thing you'll see. A lot of people on the other side of this won't actually cite sources. They'll say this is true, but they won't say where they got that information from. Or if they do, you do a little bit of digging, you might find oh it's like a kind of a trade uh, association papers. <laughs> well, let's let's uh, kind of go around the horn here. Um, uh, each of you maybe take a minute. If, let's let's just pretend that you were 
a witness at a legislative hearing. Or you were talking to your own state lawmaker. And you were talking to your own state lawmaker. Marbella, what would you tell that lawmaker about legalization of marijuana? About this policy, yeah. When you look at what's going on in our communities, are you willing to see our families destroyed, our communities destroyed at a more rapid rate if you legalize it? Is this what you want on your conscience? Good. All right. Thank you. Ron, your take. Well, 17% of those 18 and under who use marijuana develop and uh, dependence. Marijuana abuse is accountable for 67% of all adolescent substance abuse and the number one reason why youth in Colorado are, are admitted to substance abuse treatment centers. What parent as a legislator do you want to sit in front of and say it's recreational and um, it's not legal for kids that are under 21 so we're really sorry and oh and liquor is so much worse. You know, I, I was taught by a pretty traditional dad. Two wrongs don't make a right. That's right. That's right. Thank you. You know, you said something about dependence there. I just got a comment real quick is you said it creates dependence. Um, and to my libertarian friends who may be watching tonight, do we really want to increase uh, more, you know, the, the, the number of dependents on the nanny state? I mean, it's well, counterproductive that, that, what we're trying to do. You hit the nail on the head. Do you do you want to not have another ten percent in your workforce? Yeah. As an educator, do I want another ten percent in my school that are not ready to, to to learn every day? No. Do we want another ten percent that can't fill that truck driving job? You know, right now we just had a, a, a good friend of mine does major construction. Bid came in forty million dollars over for labor. Part of it is Colorado was booming, but the other part of it is there are not enough workers that can pass the drug test. This isn't a recreation. We are setting people up for failure. And I thought that was the whole idea of government. Government was supposed to be for the people to protect the people. And sometimes you gotta protect them from themselves. Right. Dr. Weiner, your message for lawmakers. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, I, I would encourage everyone to talk to your lawmaker. They, they, they do listen. Um, and they care about what you have to say. Um, I think at the core of it, if I was going to make it simple, it's does this make Illinois a better state? Is this promoting the health and well-being of its citizens? And, and if so, how? And, and, and the problem is that if you if you look around, right, even if you I think really the, the only thing that you, you hear about why this is really going to be useful is revenue. But like Ron was saying, we have data out of the CDC you lose 10 to $15. We've seen this from alcohol and tobacco, 10 to $15 from every dollar that you make in revenue. So it's a profoundly losing proposition. And even if you look at the revenue, it's, it's like, it's like blood money, you know, like at, at what cost is, do we really want to be making money off the backs of addiction and have poor, because that's the one thing we know more people are going to use if you enact this law. So do you, do you want kind of going back to what Marbella was say, do you want that on your hands? The car crashes, the addiction, all of that. Is that how we want to make our money here? Or is there a better way to do it? Yeah, very good. All right. Well, Dave, very important vote coming up. Yep. Uh, early voting getting underway shortly. Right. We want Cook County voters especially to say no, no on marijuana. That's right. We have a voter guide. Right. IllinoisFamily.org. Uh, you can get a voter guide online or you can call the office at 708-781-9328. Yeah, it's right there at the bottom of the screen later. Uh, and uh, you can ask that uh, a voter guide be mailed to you, and it will tell you where all the candidates stand on this, this issue and others, uh, at least the ones who are running for governor, are all uh, out and uh, saying if they support or oppose. I believe all the Democratic candidates uh, support and all the Republican candidates oppose it. So, um, yeah, so, but make sure you get out and vote. It's our civic duty to get out and vote. And early voting starts February 8th and runs through March 20th. And there is absolutely no reason with that window, uh, a 40 day window to vote that you can't vote. So make sure you do. Let's, uh, panelists, uh, if you could give us your contact information if people want to know about uh, best resources uh, to 
find out about marijuana, you know, that sort of thing. Marvella, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, my email address is blackmarvella at sbcglobal.net. All right. Good. Thank you. And Ron? rdrc55 at comcast.net. Dr. Weiner? That's A-A-R-O-N dot W-E-I-N-E-R. So Aaron dot Weiner at E as in Edward, E-E health dot org. All right. Thank you so much to our panelists for being a part of this uh, presentation. Thank and, you very uh, much. This, uh, this will be on YouTube a little later uh, this week. All right. Make sure you vote and vote no on the legalization of marijuana. In Thanks. Cook County. Thank you very much, gentlemen. And, and Marvell. <laughs> and other states have said no. Arizona has said no. Ohio has said no. It doesn't have to be a slam dunk. Amen. Good deal. Thank you, gentlemen. And Marvell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.